Welcome everybody. Um, I just realized that I still have a YouTube channel open in the background and it's loud. I'm going to make sure that's closed. Um, okay, welcome. Uh, I'm going to be talking about improvisation today. It's nice to see everybody here already. Um, <clears throat> and uh, feel free to jump in, leave a, a question or a comment in the chat. I have some specific things I'm going to talk about, <clears throat> and I have some questions that came in ahead of time uh, from my email. So I'm going to prioritize those, but I want to be able to uh, answer questions as we go too. So what I'm going to do, uh, this is going to go for about an hour. So I will spend the first 20 to 30 minutes going through these topics that I have laid out, these seven uh, steps uh, or rules or suggestions. And then um, uh, pause, take some questions about anything that I've been talking about, get into some of these other questions, which are probably uh, pretty common questions. I mean, they're good questions, but they sound like questions um, that a lot of people might have. And then also we'll take some additional questions from the chat. Don't worry about leaving a question while I'm talking. Um, it's only a little distracting and that's on me for like keeping an eye on the chat while I'm talking about stuff. But you can go ahead and post questions. Uh, if stuff drifts up through the chat, uh, <clears throat> by the time I get to answering questions, uh, you can post it again just so that, you know, that I can see it and I'm not scrolling back through things. But I'm gonna to present today's ideas in the key of A, doing steady bass blues in A. Um, there's no tab for this lesson. Uh, it's more about the ideas than the specific licks. Um, I do go over a lot of improvisation material inside my membership, the Fingerstyle 5. I know a bunch of you here are already doing that. Some of you may not be. I've posted a link on the YouTube page right below the video. If you want to go um, learn more about the membership, uh, there's a video where I explain what's going on. There's some sample lessons posted. It's all on a page that I've set up that you can go look at. You can also ask anybody here about it uh, who is uh, doing it. You can always post a question. Someone might answer you right here in the chat or you can ask me about it towards the back half. But really, uh, just to say like, <clears throat> inside that format, I do often tab out a lot of things. Today, I wanted to keep it a little bit loose and feel like I could talk about things that come up without being tied to a specific set of exercises. But I do have seven specific things to try and I will illustrate them as clearly as I can using only my bare hands. So the first, uh, the first step for improvising uh, for better improvisation is to play the form. And this is an idea that I've talked about plenty before, but it's the idea <clears throat> that the whatever song you're playing, in this case, the 12 bar blues, it has a form, meaning it has a shape. It's 12 bars and it's got these three lines. And when you listen to the way people sing the blues, they sing it in this three line form, this AAB form, where there's a first line like, Nobody loves me but my mother, and she could be jiving me too. That's the first line, right? And then the next line is a re repetition or a slight variation like, I said nobody loves me but my mother, and she could be jiving me too. That's over the second four bars. And then the third line is the punch line or the turnaround or some combination of that, you know. When you see me worry, well, it's you I hate to lose, right? It's the line that rhymes. It's the line that kind of like ties up the verse. And so... When you're improvising, you don't have to look at those 12 bars as this big, wide open blank canvas, right? You can look at it as this three line structure. And so what you play in the first line can be something that you repeat in the second line, and then you try to change it up in the third line. So if I just start off with a couple of simple blues licks. There's my first line. Now I don't have to come up with something new for the second line because I've got something. I've got the line I just played. And if I was singing, I'd repeat that line. So when I'm playing, I'll do the same thing. And it'll feel like a little variation because now I got to put it over a D chord. And I'm back to A. So there's my second line. Now when I come to the third line, now I want to change it up. It's a super simple idea. 
but it suddenly means that you don't need to come up with 12 bars of ideas. You just need to come up with eight bars, right? Because you come up with the first four bars and then you repeat it. And it could be anything. You know, if you start off with this, uh, let's see. Now I can go to the next line. So that's a really simple idea <clears throat> and a really basic idea, but playing the form on the blues just means thinking AAB. <clears throat> Excuse me, play a line. <clears throat> this would be great if I was singing around, I got my gravelly voice. Play a line, repeat it, and then play a change up for the, for the answer. So that's idea number one, play the form. And there are different ways you can do that. Um, but the simplest way is to think A, A, B. So now idea number two is to play phrases into the downbeat. So playing phrases in the first place, instead of thinking about scale notes, right? And then playing them into the downbeats. Let me take those two things apart. So right now I'm really just using uh, the A blues scale, which is the same thing basically as the minor pentatonic scale with the flat five added. So, and it's working over the one chord, and then it's working over the four chord, and then with a little bit of readjusting, adjusting of where the emphasis is going, it's working on the five chord. So that's my one scale. But instead of just thinking pentatonic notes, right, or blues scale notes, which means just kind of randomly like, oh yeah, that might work. I'm thinking in terms of phrases like, or licks, same idea, right? Just two different words for the same thing. And not only am I thinking about that, but you know, as soon as I'm thinking about phrases instead of scale notes, I'm thinking about actual musical ideas, phrases like, you know, the idea of I am speaking a phrase as opposed to just collection, words, sentence, idea, right? I am, you know, a phrase is putting something into, a phrase has direction, right? It's, it's got a beginning, a middle, and an end, however short it may be, and it's going somewhere. It's communicating an idea. So that's doing something, and it's landing here on the root. It's taking you to the root, and the root is the landing spot. And if I time it so that it, that happens right when I get to the downbeat, it sounds cool. just to fit the chord. Right, so that's one kind of phrase. Now, that's a very short phrase. It starts on the end of three. One and two and three and four and one. You could make a phrase that lasts longer, right? You could start on say the end of one. One and two and three and four now, both kinds of phrases work, both kinds of phrases exist in the blues, and one of the most common ways you hear them is you hear a short phrase answered by a long phrase. And you can hear that that just sounds like blues playing. That's a really common kind of phrasing. And in fact, it comes right out of the way blues gets sung. Like if you think about, um, you know, a short phrase, they call it Stormy Monday. That's, da, 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 da. that's seven notes, but still, it's a short phrase. They call it Stormy Monday, but Tuesday is just as bad. And so there's the answer. And now sometimes 
those two phrases are about the same length. But something like, uh, the sky is crying, that's only five syllables, right? The sky is crying, can't you see the tears roll down the street, right? So that's a shorter phrase. It's more like that. But this is a really uh, important idea as far as to play phrases, not just, so to go from playing scale notes to playing phrases, and then to think about phrases that resolve, that land, that are leading you up to the next important moment, which is the next bar. So, one, two, three, four, one. Three and, well, sorry, four and one, two. I was getting someone trying to count and play at the same time. But so you can hear the first phrase and then labored any more than I already have. First idea is to play the form. Second idea is to play phrases that arrive at the downbeat, play phrases into the downbeat. And you can see how these two things go together, right? Because you could play a short and then long phrase. That's your first line. Cool, I've got my first line. That means I've got my second line. To just point out there's another another kind of phrase that happens as you get into the third line as you get to the five and the turnaround which is that sometimes uh, it happens everywhere but particularly on the five chord you might land at the five and kind of delay the resolution until you're midway through the bar so like you don't just get to the e right you get to the e and you continue on a little bit one, two, and, right? And you can hear that. And so it doesn't really resolve till beat three of that measure. And then you have your, your lick that resolves from D back to A again. So play phrases into the downbeat. The third idea, or the third rule, or actually we like the idea of suggestions more than rules, but the third idea is to repeat yourself. Repeat yourself and develop it. And we've already seen that idea of repetition on in terms of the form, like play the first line, then repeat and vary for the second line. But, you know, the idea of taking a lick, those th first four notes, and then start again with the same opening idea, but then keep going. So again, now, you know, originally we said, oh, if you come up with the first line, you got the second line. Well, now if you come up with the first phrase, <laughs> you got the whole line in the bag, because you know you're going to repeat it and continue. All right, so there's that. And resolve. Now you could also, you could come, I mean, you could... You know, your second phrase doesn't have to go down the same way. It could be, you know, or so now you've got, you know, places you can go. And so you could start to introduce some variation because you're going to use repetition when you get to the second line, but maybe you answer your phrase differently the second time. Maybe the first time you go down. But this time we're going to repeat. You know, so you could be doing something like that. So, Repetition is really built into the whole thing. One of the things that um, I remember seeing when I first started teaching soloing 
way, you know, teaching like electric guitar and teaching people the solo was that people would freak out because they were like, what am I going to play next? Like, I have to keep coming up with stuff. I'm like, no, like you don't have to keep coming up with stuff. You can keep playing a lot of the same stuff over and over and over again. And in fact, there's some famous quote, I can't remember who it's from, some classical composer who said, you can't have theme and variations without a theme, right? So your solo needs a theme, like it needs something to work off of. And you can swipe that from the melody of the song you're playing. You can just have a little collection of starter licks. And it, all those starter licks, you, know, you can sit around and come up with these and four and one licks. <laughs> there. You can start a solo with any of those. Right? So you've got, again, you've got places to go. Um, so, uh, so there it is. I'm trying not to get distracted by what's going on in the chat, but I just want to give a shout out to my pal, Jeff Mackerlane. Great to see you here. And Jeff does live streams on a regular basis. And if you're interested in playing electric blues, run, don't walk to jeffmackerlane.com. He is totally wicked. So, and one of the best teachers I know, as well as one of the best players I know. And uh, you will probably disapprove of the coffee I'm drinking because it probably is not as good as the coffee he's drinking right now. But anyway. Um, okay, so play the form, play phrases into the downbeat, repeat yourself and develop it. Four, use contrast. So contrast means whatever you're doing, what can you do that's different, right? Now there are a lot of ways you can do contrast and it doesn't have to, well, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is a lot of electric players will contrast major and minor pentatonic, which is something someone asked me about, and I'll get to that later. But um, it doesn't have to be more scales. It could be something as simple as, uh, um, you know, register, or like just even an example of going up or landing an octave away, right? It could be making your answer more of a chordal kind of thing, right? That's not even chords, that's just sixths. That's just. And so the contrast between single, single notes. Which could of course work the other way as well. Right, going from sixths into single note stuff. Or, you know, answering your licks with chord stuff. Actual full chords. Um, like... So, things like that. But you can also use things like dynamics, um, you know, and you can also use, yeah, scale choices. So, um, taking the minor pentatonic sound, sound so you have um, a ma a ma like a you know the call the first phrase like of a call and response being bluesy and minor So those kinds of things. But again, it can be really uh, simple and it can just exploit things you already know. And meaning like if you know some double stop licks and you know some single note licks, you can be mixing and matching those. Um, and also you can contrast rhythms, right? Like using this sort of swinging uh, eighth note feel and then using triplets.
So a one and a two and a three and a four and so. And, you know, and not only that, but even like, you know, double time, right? So 16th notes. So you could be um, contrasting. You know, and a little goes a long way. You don't you want to do that all the time. Um, I probably have like three of those licks total anyway, so I got to be sparing with them. But the idea that you can uh, be contrasting those kinds of things. And if it's really busy, You can always flip it around. So, contrast. So, playing the form, playing phrases into the downbeat, repeating yourself and developing it using contrast. Number five is playing the groove. And I know this sounds kind of obvious, but what I mean by that is another thing that I would always talk about teaching electric guitar soloing was then like people when you go up to play like if, if you're playing with other people or you're playing in front of other people or you're just you know playing with your friends everybody gets nervous and feels like they have to fill up the space um, because if you don't fill up the space it looks like you're lost right I mean I, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about it's like I mean I've done it everybody's done it it's kind of like you know, it's like someone who gets nervous and talks too much when they meet you. Uh, you know, it's like because it, it, the, the empty space feels dangerous. And so we have a tendency as guitar players to fill up space. So um, what I would always tell people is, you know, just because you are not, when you take your hands off the guitar in the middle of a solo, it's not like everything stops. The drummer is still playing time. Bass player is still grooving. You know, if there's like rhythm guitar or keyboards or whatever, um, you know, uh, the little dark voice on my left shoulder wants to say, and the harmonica player is always playing, but I won't say that. Um, but, because uh, I love harmonica. Um, but, uh, you know, when you stop playing, the groove is still going, right? And so, if you're playing a groove, and I'm not just playing steady bass on the one, right? I'm, I'm playing this little bass line and I've got these little offbeats on the ands. So even though I'm only playing on like the first two bars of each line, trying to make sure that the groove is doing something and that the groove is like fun to play with you know fun to hear fun to to you know to do on the guitar fun for somebody to listen to so by making one of these ideas play the groove means you know remember that you don't have to be playing licks for something to be happening even if you're playing solo you know um, and so in this case, like I sort of just broke it down, the groove is made up of like there's the steady pulse and there's the fact that now there's like this little bass line. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. And then there's this component of playing the offbeats so you can not actually feel the groove. The thumb doesn't tell you the whole groove. That just tells you quarter notes. But the offbeats... That tells you whether it's grooving or whether it's whether it's a shuffle groove, right? Swinging in a shuffle groove, or whether it's straight. So.
so in this case, you only need that one groove figure because that's every time you come back to the one. Right? You're playing, the, you know, you're playing your licks on the one chord, you're playing your licks on the four chord, and you're playing your licks on the five chord. But the empty space where we're not soloing is always going to come back to the one. So rule number five is play the groove. Uh, rule number six is to think about foreground and background. And this is more of like a, this is more of a um, technique idea, but it's a technique uh, in the service of a musical idea. And so this question often comes up like, well, you know, should I work on technique? And if someone's asking me, should I work on technique? My answer is annoyingly another question, which is, what do you want to be able to do? You know, if you want to be able to play like John Lee Hooker, then you should probably not work on playing bebop licks because all the bebop technique, bebop technique in the world is not going to help you play like John Lee Hooker. And, you know, if you want to play burning single note jazz lines, then, you know, working on Reverend Gary Davis is probably not going to be a big help. So technique, you know, what's technique? So um, in this case, this is a technique to help you get this musical idea of foreground and background, which is that you're trying to get these uh, single note licks to pop out in front. And so, um, a lot of this is like the palm muting, right? Like letting this part of your hand rest on the bridge so that the, you know, the notes aren't just ringing out. Like a lot of times if you learn alternating thumb picking, your hand is off the face of the guitar, right? Off the strings. And so you want to, you want those notes to ring out because it's more of an arpeggiated kind of thing. But if you're trying to play something that feels like a solo out in front of the groove, then the foreground is the licks and the background is the groove. So it's there, but it's not supposed to be in your face. And so palm muting and also just not picking as hard as you can and getting the control to kind of put these notes out in front. So it doesn't sound like. Right, foreground and background. The melody's out front. And the bass is, you know, you hear it further back because of the muting and because of the dynamics. So that's number six. Use for, think about foreground and background. And finally, number seven, because I want to make sure there's time to talk about some other stuff. Number seven is use articulations and dynamics. And again, this is like, well, of course. But um, if, you've, if you've, I don't know why I keep talking about so much about electric guitar today, but it, I think it's because I learned how to improvise first playing electric guitar, and I think a lot of people do. And then you go to play, you go to play finger style, and it's like you're so caught up in just trying to coordinate everything that the idea of really like applying the same thought process to improvising seems like a remote possibility. But again, like you don't have to play anything complicated to start bringing in some of the more musical qualities that you have when you play single notes. And articulations and dynamics are part of that. So like hammering on, like not just playing the notes, not just picking everything like an exercise, but thinking, how would you phrase it? And um, one of the greatest ideas I ever got about, about phrasing, actually, this was sort of the other way around. Like I was, uh, as ever, like trying to sing better, a very ongoing process. And I was talking to uh, a guitar player that I know from teaching for years and years uh, at guitar workshops, this guy, Matt Smith, who you're probably familiar with. Great teacher, great musician, great singer, all that great producer. Anyway, and he was saying like singing, like singing is just phrasing. He's like, you know how to play guitar, you know how to play a solo, just think about how you'd phrase the melody on the guitar and then do it with your voice. And kind of the same thing applies to playing, uh, to improvising over an alternating thumb or a steady bass, like to finger style soloing, which is, you know how the guitar is supposed to sound. It's not supposed to sound like, it's supposed to sound like, right? It's supposed to sound, 
Like it has a little attitude, like it's cool. It's like it's doing something. So what's going on? Well, it's a slide and then it's a hammer on with some vibrato. So can you put that together over the bass? Right, and so all that kind of push and pull, instead of just playing it straight, like. So. So a little bit of like syncopated phrasing and a little bit of hammering on and a little bit of dynamics, right? That first note's louder than the second note. There's three notes that really poke out at you. It really just comes down to making it sound good, which, is, which sounds like absurd. Like, oh, that's great advice. Of course I'm trying to make it sound good. Which, but I've, I had a lesson with, and I've mentioned this like a million times before, but it was just so, just made so much sense to me. Uh, or made such an impression on me. So the alto saxophone player, Lee Konitz, used to teach, uh, used to give lessons uh, at his apartment on the Upper East Side. And when I was young and stupid and had no business going there, I went and had a lesson. And he would talk about these levels of improvisation and how the first or second level is just to play the melody. And so you play the melody like as literally as possible. That's level one. And then level two was to play the melody and as he would say, make it hip. And I was like, make it hip? What do you mean? He was like, well, you know, like you were cutting a record, which was something I had never done, of course, at the time. I'd never cut a record. Um, I don't think he said side, but he might have said like you were cutting a side, but I think it was like you were making a record or cutting a record. And so the idea is like, in order to play with good phrasing and to play a melody or a lick in a way that sounds cool or that sounds good, you have to like have an idea of what that would be. You know, like you have to imagine like, well, what would it sound like if it was great, if it was cool? Like, what would it sound like? Yeah, it would have this dynamic push and pull, it would push and pull, it would have a little vibrato, it would be articulated with slides and hammer-ons. So before you even, you know, once you know what you want to put over the bass, take a moment to divorce the bass from the melody and look at just the melody, playing with your fingers, and think, what do I want this melody to do to really make it sing? I don't know if that's gonna fit over the bass, but if it did, you know. Oh, it does. Okay, I wasn't sure if that was gonna work out. But so, you know, take the melody by itself. Once you know that the melody is gonna fit with the bass, then try to work out like, all right. Okay, I want a little bit of a bend there. I want a little bit of a push on this note and let it drag a little bit in terms of the time and hammer on and pull off. And then I want to really like punch that last note. Now go back. And see if you can work it out. So, those are my seven things. One, play the form. Two, play phrases on the downbeat, uh, into the downbeat. Three, Repeat yourself and develop your ideas. Four, use contrast. Five, play the groove. Six, uh, think foreground and background. And seven, use articulations and dynamics. Okay, let me wrap there for now. Um, that took me like twice as long as I thought it would, which is not really that surprising. That seems to happen. I've got these three specific, three or four specific questions that I plan to answer, but I'm gonna pause here I'm gonna play a couple choruses using that stuff. And if you've got some specific questions about it, then post them while I'm playing. You can put them in the chat. And I will start with these questions here and then, uh, and then post questions if you've got it. Especially if it's a, well, if it's a follow-up question to what, we've been, what I've been talking about so far, I'll try to answer that first. So here we go. One, two.
see if there's some questions here. Um, what does play phrases into the downbeat mean? Oh, in the downbeat, yeah, into the downbeat. I can re-explain that because it's important and it might have gone by fast. Uh, can I talk about placing of licks in the bar, playing into the downbeat and resolving? Yes, I can talk about both of those things because um, they're important to clarify. Uh, this is, um, and yes, I uh, saw some discussion about PDF or no PDF. There is not a PDF for today's lesson, but there are more PDFs than you could, <laughs> well, there's a boatload of free PDFs if you go to, uh, I'll put the link in at the end, but I have, a, I have like a ton of PDFs uh, that you can download for free that go with my YouTube lessons. And then also in my membership, there is, there are, every month there are, you know, tabs for the tunes that we're working on, the improvisations that we're working on, the arranging that we're working on, all kinds of stuff like that. So, and again, there's a link uh, on the YouTube page with more information about the membership. And you can ask anybody here who's in it about it as well, or ask me that towards the end. Um, okay. Um, so playing into the downbeat, let me go over that again. So the idea is that if you're counting one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four, and one, then playing into the downbeat means starting your lick somewhere in the middle of the measure you're on so that it lands, the last note lands on the one of the next measure. So if you're starting before the tune even starts, if you're counting off one and two and three and four and one, then you just land it on the downbeat. You need to land on the downbeat of the first measure, the downbeat being the first, you know, the one, the first beat of the first measure. One, two, three, and four, and one. And you could do it again. So short phrases like that, but also longer phrases, like I mentioned, like starting on the and of one. So one and two and three and four and one. <clears throat> one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one. And two and three and four and one. This is a really good exercise because one of the things that I'm really always up on my soapbox about is practicing improvisation, right? Like you don't have to just wing it or kind of hope for the best. Like if you want to be able to play these phrases that land, take one phrase in open position where you can get to all the roots and just can you get into, can you get from the one to the four? Can you get from the four to the one? Can you get from the one to the five? Can you get from the five back to the one? It's really just like four things you gotta be able to do. And notice that you're not, I'm not saying, can you play it over the one? Can you play it over the four? Cause that's not what matters. Like it's good to be able to do that, but what matters is the transition. Like the licks should take you from the one to the four and they should take you from the four back to the one. So that way you are leading the chord progression around instead of the chord progression pushing you around. So So here, here I'm going from the one to the four, right? Boy, this is coming into the one. Now here's going from the four to the one. Now I'm going to go from the one to the four. And then from the four to the one. And now from the one to the five. Where I got to land on a different note. Right? Okay. So I think that clarifies that. Um, okay, uh, so I think Richard, were you the one who actually had this question initially? I hope that, oh yes, okay, good. So we've cleared up that. 
Um, boy, and I have these other things to talk about too. Well, let me get to some of those. Um, mm, okay, so here are a couple specific questions that came in. And I'm gonna deal with these in a semi-perfunctory manner. Um, just so I can answer as many of these as possible. So Peter asked if I could talk about the swing scale, which is uh, kind of a shorthand of mine for, talk, for combining the minor and the major pentatonic, or really the blues scale and the pentatonic scale. And it's the scale that, I call it the swing scale because when I was first listening to people like Charlie Christian and other swing musicians, I noticed this is kind of, this is the sound that I heard and, it's, and when I kind of broke it down, to me and my guitar playing ears, it sounded like this combination of major and minor pentatonic. And so what it is, is if you look at the minor pentatonic scale, and we'll include the flat five, make it a blues scale. And then you look at the major pentatonic scale. So the minor pentatonic scale, root, flat three, four, flat five, five, flat seven, root. Major pentatonic, root, two, three, five, or five, six, root. Now you lay those two over each other and you get one, root, two, flat three, three, four, flat five, five, six, flat seven. It might look more familiar if you do it up here, right? So here's blues scale and here's major pentatonic and you lay them over each other. And all these familiar licks, I mean, you can hear Charlie Christian in there, right? I haven't left this swing scale yet, right? I can even pull out all the notes of the D chord. Just using the notes of this A swing scale. And I can even play over the 2 5. And so, can I use that over the steady bass? scale and you can do it in open position too right and that's a lot easier That is the basic idea, is that you can mix and match and start to spell out the changes. This is a, this is a bigger idea than I can really address in this particular workshop, and I should probably practice more before I start trying to do it. But that's the idea behind the swing scale. It's a combination of the major and the blue scale and the major pentatonic scale. So um, let me go to the next question here. Uh, Terry asked, about using flat five in a phrase. This is kind of related, so that's good. And how to use, should you use flat five as a passing tone? How much should you use it? If you're just going for like blues, like I've been playing for most of this hour, I always think of flat five as it's the note, instead of bending on electric guitar, right? Where you, right when you're here, I can't even do it, right? Because I got wound strings, but that sound gets replaced in swing and jazz by the flat five, right? Instead of bending a whole step, right? So, so this is where I think of using the flat five the most is if I'm on the four and I'm gonna go up as like a grace note 
from flat five to four to flat three to root. Or, right? Right, so there's, there's a couple more uses, right? So sliding from flat five to five and over to the flat seven. And then sliding down from flat five to four. Right, so there's a few different uses or, you know, flat five and six sliding up to five and seven. So there's like, and you know, if you're going to just use it as a straight passing tone, yeah. In that swing context, flat three, three, four, flat five, five. So there's at least three or four ways off the top of my head when I'm thinking, yeah, into the five, down into the four. So resolving either way, uh, or as a little neighbor tone. The neighbor of the four, like going up and back, and then finally as a as a climbing passing tone. Uh, or coming down. Again, these are all sort of more swing flavored licks. But for like the real like hardcore bluesy stuff. which kind of echoes what's going on with um, the flat three, right? Because flat three can go up and it can come down. All right, so flat three going up to three and flat three coming down to two. Right, I mean, where would Rockabilly be without that lick, right? kinds of, you know, there's flat three to two, there's flat, flat seven to six, there's flat five to four to flat three. So, um, and finally, uh, this is kind of a good question to start wrapping up on from Robert. This is kind of a two-part question. Uh, could I talk about stages or levels of improvisation? Um, what were the steps to learning to improvise for me and what helped me to progress? And when I post, like I posted a, a full song yesterday on my channel. So when I post what sections are arranged, what are improvised and how am I thinking and how far ahead? So um, I am thinking, I mean, I'm kind of thinking about these things that I'm talking about, right? I'm thinking about the form and I'm thinking about the phrasing, but there's sort of a process of pouring that stuff into your brain and playing it on purpose. And then if you play it on purpose enough, it starts to become more intuitive. So the process was listening, going back and listening to like some really foundational blues guitarists and singers, like going back and listening to Freddie King and BB King and No More James and people like that. And listening not just to how they soloed, but how they sang. Right? And not getting super scientific about like how exactly did they you know, do the pitches or whatever, but more about the phrasing, right? like the rhythmic outline of what they're doing. Because that's so much easier to approximate at first. Right? And if you play some, it's much more, rhythm is much more forgiving than note choice. Right? If you play cool, convincing rhythms in time, then the licks don't have to be nearly as good. Uh, you know, and you can just focus on filling that rhythmic container, right? Just, you know, I just show you, like you can play four or five licks all with the same phrasing that leads into the downbeat and fantastic, like you're done, you know? Then you can work on getting the melodic content like better and better. But so going back and listening and realizing that there's, whether intentional or not, like I really, know, I don't think Freddie King sat around and thought about phrasing. I don't think he sat, sat around and thought about, you know, using repetition or using dynamics. I think he just thought about, you know, what he'd heard and what he wanted to hear come out of his guitar or out of his mouth and just tried to make it sound as good as he could. And I'm sure he had models. I mean, B.B. King is a guy who has been very clear about who he listened to and how. Like, you know, he wanted to sound like Lonnie Johnson and he wanted to sound like Django and he wanted to sound like 
Charlie Christian. He wanted to sound like T-Bone Walker. And there's even like a period when you can tell he's really getting pretty good at sounding like T-Bone Walker. Um, you know, and luckily he ends up, oh, and he wanted to sound like Bucka White, his cousin Bucka White is playing slide guitar. And so all these things came together and ended up being B.B. King. But he went through these, this apprenticeship of trying to sound a certain way. And with that comes, you know, you absorb people's phrasing, their tone, their dynamics, their articulation, all that stuff, you know. So we're all kind of trying to short circuit that in a way by writing stuff out in tab and like getting books and getting videos. Um, nothing really replaces listening, records, recordings, whatever, finding videos. I mean, there's so much archival video, right? Like, you know, you can watch these people play, which is a miracle basically, you know, but hearing people. And again, like when you listen, like, you know, aside from listening from enjoyment, right? Which is really easy to lose because like, you're thinking so much about this stuff, but aside from listening from enjoyment, which I, you know, still try to do and encourage you to do, of course, um, when you're listening with your analytical hat on, like start with the biggest picture, which is like, listen for the form, listen for the phrasing, listen for the shape of what's going on. Don't worry if you can get every note, you know? Tab has a way of making you think you should be able to play every note that someone else played. And, you know, when I was learning to play and I didn't have tab of something and I was figuring it off the record, I got close. You know, I got as close as I could get. I wanted to know exactly what was going on. And as soon as I could slow stuff down and figure it out, that was awesome. But the things that I really remember are the things that I worked out off of records and got pretty close. So um, when I wanted to really like understand and be able to explain improvising to myself and to anybody else who was, I was trying to teach, going to those records and figuring out these ideas about form and phrasing were really the thing. And then looking at the licks that I knew and thinking about them in terms of, do they resolve? Do they fit the form? Am I re do they involve repetition? Do they involve development? You know, and I had one guitar teacher in particular, this guy, Jim, uh, Jim, Peter Einhorn, who talked about this idea of motivic development, like taking an idea and then building on it and developing it and doing stuff with it, you know? So it didn't just come out of nowhere. And the idea about playing the form came straight out of arranging lessons that I took uh, one summer uh, with, with Bill Dobbins, the pianist and arranger. So like these ideas came from somewhere, but um, that was my process. And so when I'm playing, like some of that stuff is conscious. Like if I'm stuck, I'm like, well, let me play, you know, let me think about the form, you know. But uh, when I'm, uh oh, do we just lose the stream? No, the stream is, stream is still cool. Um, may have dropped out for a second, but uh, you know, this stuff is kind of internalized now, but I will still use it consciously if I'm stuck for an idea. You know, if I feel like, man, this is getting kind of slow, this is getting kind of boring, like just remind myself to play the groove, remind myself to phrase the downbeat, remind myself to use contrast, right? Um, <laughs> Jeff Mackerel and I both have a, a, this friend, uh, this guitar player, Chris Amalar, who said he used to keep this thing, a piece of paper taped to his guitar. I think it was Chris, it just said breathe remember to breathe and I think he meant like both like literally and also like musically like leave space breathe you know there's there's plenty of time there's plenty of room you're going to be able to play what you need to play so I encourage you to practice improvising in the sense that take these specific ideas and just can you execute them you know slow it down like that's the great thing about practicing is you can do it as slow as you need to you can do it as long as you need to so that it makes sense. So, you know, taking individual phrases, putting them over the bass, thinking about how they're articulated, you know, and the thing that's really amazing is as you start to think about things like this, like these specific ideas, when you go back out and listen to stuff, you'll start to notice it more. Like it sharpens your ears, like practicing makes you hear better, hearing better makes you practice better. It's kind of amazing, but there's an interaction between the two. So that's kind of just my own sort of, the answer to that question, just as far as like, what am I thinking about? I try to do all the thinking when I'm practicing so that then when I sit around and play, it's more intuitive. But, you know, some of my practicing is, you know, like everybody's just, it's like sitting around the house, just picking up the guitar and it's a little bit of playing and a little bit of practicing. It's like, well, I'm kind of trying to play this tune and I wonder if I can remember that thing I was working on. But if not, I'll just play what I got. But then when I'm practicing for real, I try not to play too much and get lost, but really focus on like, 
setting up parameters. Like what I'm trying to do right now is get from this chord to that chord with this kind of phrasing and this kind of lick and this kind of expression at this tempo. Like the more specific you can be, you want to get to where practicing, you got to know if you did it or not, right? It's got to be like this binary thing. It's like, did you execute the thing you were trying to do or not? That's what makes improvising so squishy, right? You can just sit around and noodle and did you improvise? Yes, of course you did. But did you get better at improvising? Not necessarily. It, but if you set up, you know, some hoops to jump through, then you know whether you jump through them or not. And that's why thinking about phrasing, thinking about time, thinking about the groove, working with a metronome, being aware of the form, all that stuff, you can be more conscious about what you're doing. The more conscious you are about it, I know there's an argument that like, well, then it won't be intuitive and it won't be expressive. And like, maybe it'll be a little less intuitive and a little, a little less expressive at first. But what you're trying to create is control over the elements. And once you have control over the tools at your disposal, you can use them more expressively. The idea is to get the difficulties out of the way, right? To get the friction out of the way. So the technique, problems with technique or not being able to reach that lick or not being able to sync up your fingers with your thumb, that's a friction problem, right? If you can't synchronize your fingers with your thumb, you can't play finger style. So you got to like get that dialed in. And then when you get that dialed in, yeah, you got to be more conscious. You'll be more aware of what you're doing at first and then it will become more intuitive. And then the range of what you can express yourself doing will have increased. That's the net gain that you'll, that you'll have seen. So that's what I came here to talk about. I hope I answered your questions and gave you some things to think about. Um, this stream will stay up for a while if you want to, you know, continue to watch it. Um, again, I will put a link to uh, the tabs for my YouTube channel. Uh, I'll put that below. I'll put that in the chat. Uh, at the end here. And then also, uh, if you want to uh, work on your playing every month in my membership, every month we do a new tune. We work on uh, a simple and a more elaborate version of that tune. We do blues classics. We do original blues tunes of mine. We do, uh, every month we take that song and we go through how to improvise on it, taking this kind of nuts and bolts approach. And we talk about how to arrange it and how to build out a complete arrangement of a song. Um, and I posted a song like that just yesterday on the channel. If you go and check out Muse Lissippi Ibis, that's an a, a blues in A, a 12 bar blues, where I play the arrangement. I go through, you know, some improvising, sort of demonstrate some possibilities, the full arrangement of the tune. You can hear the kinds of things that we work on. I posted Nine Pound Hammer a month ago, and that's another song we just finished working on. So if you're interested in that, uh, go check out the link that I posted, and um, I'll play a little more blues on the way out. I want to thank you all for being here. This has been a super fun. So thanks for being here, and I'll see you at the next one.
Thanks for being everybody here, being here, everybody. I'll see you next time.